All right, welcome everybody. Um, as I said earlier, today's talk is going to be PCI scope reduction using tokenization for security assessors. Uh, just to introduce ourselves real quick, um, we have Alex Pezzled here with us. He's the co-founder and CEO of TokenX and a former QSA. We have John Noltensmeyer. He is our uh, head of privacy and compliance solutions. My name is Avery Oden. I'm the marketing director here at TokenX, and I'll be acting as moderator. Um, I do want to say uh, we encourage everybody attending to submit questions throughout the presentation. Um, we'll do our best to address every question that's submitted. Uh, those who aren't answered during the presentation will be followed up and addressed at the end or addressed via email follow-up after the presentation. Um, like I said, we'll try our best to answer 100% of the questions submitted and uh, we appreciate your, your time and attention and attendance. Uh, I also want to draw attention to the uh, handout section. Uh, we have an available resource there for download called Tokenization for QSAs, Assessing a Tokenization Implementation. Uh, that's going to cover a lot of the uh, topics covered during this presentation, as well as a complete list of all relevant PCI controls addressed by tokenization and uh, as well as a typical cost analysis breakdown of on-premise versus cloud tokenization. So uh, it's really a good handbook for QSAs and ISAs to have whenever assessing possible vendors, whenever assessing uh, possible implementations for your customers, and uh, sort of a good overview of the cost breakdown and, and what you can expect on that end. Um, so with that being said, uh, I'd like to pass it over to Alex Pezzled uh, to cover the agenda and we can go ahead and get started here. Thanks very much, Avery, and uh, thank you everybody for joining the webinar uh, on tokenization for QSAs. Uh, kind of the impetus behind this initiative was largely because a lot, of, a lot of the QSAs that we've run into at the community meetings recently, while familiar with tokenization, certainly um, you know, are not embracing this tool set as a means to uh, kind of bolster not only credibility outside of just uh, recommending encryption and segmentation, uh, but also, you know, the ability to understand how tokenization uh, is leveraged beyond just processors and on-prem solutions today. So uh, there's a lot of good content within this webinar. Uh, beyond the webinar, we certainly uh, invite everybody to uh, reach out. Uh, we'd love to have discussions with you about tokenization or about, uh, you know, uh, I guess situations where you may be running into kind of a, a scoping challenge with a client. Uh, so just keep that in mind as we work through this presentation. Again, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible uh, throughout the presentation, but if we don't get a chance to answer those, we'll certainly get to those uh, by the uh, probably end of close of business tomorrow. So again, thank you very much. And to cover the agenda, uh, today we'll be talking about what is tokenization, just a basic uh, review of what it is, uh, the tokenization landscape. So who are the players? You know, What types of solutions are available to recommend as a QSA for consideration with your customers. Uh, why tokenization matters to your customer. So as a QSA, why does tokenization, why would they even care about tokenization? They're familiar with segmentation, they're familiar with encryption, but you know, as a QSA and educating and you know playing the factor or playing the you know the factors of kind of education and empowerment with your customer, um, you know, why does tokenization matter to them if they're already leveraging encryption and segmentation? Next, we'll talk about evaluating tokenization providers, so taking it a step further from you know, why tokenization matters in the, the tokenization landscape into evaluating a provider, uh, all the way into implementation pitfalls. So uh, being a tokenization integrator on our own, we see any number of different, different implementations that uh, our customers have leveraged, and we've also seen the pitfalls that have resulted from those implementations. Uh, looking at uh, last but not least, we wanted to be able to provide some education and empowerment to the QSA community on the call. So we'll be talking a little bit about the PCI tokenization tool sets, which amount to, uh, in effect, the uh, PCI Security Standards Council documentation uh, provided on the website in the form of FA FAQs, uh, uh, secure implementation guides, information supplements, uh, following all the way into you know the report of compliance, the SAQ D SP, um, or I'm sorry, SAQ D SP, um, and then last but not least, talking a little bit about the responsibilities matrix uh, and kind of what you can expect from a tokenization provider. So, um, jumping from the agenda right into kind of the biggest question uh, that, or the first question that uh, uh, for this presentation. Avery? 
Uh, yeah, well, before we get to that, I wanted to do a quick poll and get a feel for the room. Um, how familiar uh, are you guys with tokenization? So you can see four options here. Um, I consider myself an expert. I'm familiar, but have more to learn. I'm somewhat familiar or I'm not familiar at all. Uh, this, uh, we'll just do one minute here to get some answers and, um, and uh, then we'll move on to the rest of the show. And uh, this is to really just give us a, a, a feel for the room uh, to help us understand uh, you guys' familiarization. And then, um, yeah, we can go from there. All right, cool. So uh, looks like we got most of the votes in. Uh, so I'll go ahead and close this, close this and then uh, we'll uh, truck on here. So the next slide that we're going to be talking about addresses uh, a question that we run, run across quite a bit whenever we're working with you know partners and QSACs alike. Um, the the biggest question is is why would I want to recommend tokenization? Uh, you know, doesn't that really kind of cannibalize my business? And and what's meant by that is you know as a QSA you have a you know finite number of controls that you have to assess in your customer's environment on an annual basis. So looking at scope reducing technologies like tokenization, where you can affect, uh, you know, reduce scope considerably, if not, you know, potentially uh, completely eliminate um, all the scope uh, of a PCI assessment out of the people and process controls. You know, there's there there tends to be a lot of concern around. Well, I'd, I'd be chewing up my book of business if I recommended tokenization, and we wanted to address that head on because that's you know normally the first question that 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 is asked whenever we talk with. Uh, QSAs about tokenization and to address that head on, you know, plain and simply, uh, you know, there's actually been documentation and, you know, the ROC and AOCs provided for tokenization service providers. So um, at the end of the day, a, a PCI assessment is going to be required no matter what. Um, it's whether it's just the people in the process, whether it's uh, looking at the control sets that are identified for tokenization service providers. Whatever the case may be, there's still going to be any number of controls that your organization is going to need, need to assess. So the, the book of business should not be a concern. Um, looking at the people and process side of you know, the requirements, so typically that's requirement 12, uh, most people say, well, yeah, that's one of 12 requirements. But if you look through the evidentiary uh, collection phase through all the other requirements, there are still people and process, process components that need to be addressed in all of those. Uh, so long and the short of it is, you know, whether it's interviews, whether it's collecting evidence, whether it's looking at logs, whatever the case may be, um, just because tokenization in place does not mean that you need to uh, avoid validating the, the cardholder data flows where tokens are flowing now. So um, you know, last but not least, looking at environments that, that use tokenization, uh, new technologies are rolled out almost regularly, right? So looking at those new technologies, uh, whether they're uh, scope impacting or not, you really want to make sure that ongoing compliance is maintained for your customers. So uh, the long and the short of this is tokenization does not cannibalize the QSA business. Uh, if anything, um, you know, all you're doing is replacing some controls for others, but what you're doing is you're actually assisting uh, your, your customer from a scope reduction standpoint uh, all the way through, uh, you know, risk reduction and cost reduction. So we'll talk a little bit about those uh, later. And um, what, what, I've, what I really want to do out of this is actually kind of talk a little bit about what is tokenization and why it's important to our customers. And John, I've had any number of these conversations with, you know, our customer base. Uh, and so, I, you know, what I'll do is I'll hand that off to you. Yeah, thanks, Alex. So just kind of to make sure that we're all working with a common definition uh, tokenization is the process of replacing sensitive data. So in this case, we're talking about a credit card pan with a non-sensitive equivalent. So the reason that's important is because tokens then are not in scope for PCI. You can't use a token to uh, make a fraudulent transaction. Uh, tokenization is important because network segmentation is often difficult and expensive. Um, I'm continually surprised by the amount of um, number of customers that we interact with who still have flattened networks. And if you've got a flattened network of any size, implementing network segmentation can be 
difficult, if not impossible, and it certainly uh, can be uh, an expensive proposition. Uh, if you're encrypting data, which is often, uh, the, you know, the first the uh, the first step of securing card data, and, and this is not an argument against uh, encryption at all. Even if you're tokenizing, encryption still has has value. But encrypted data is still in scope uh, for the PCI DSS if you have the ability to decrypt that data. Isn't like, it, isn't it uh, just just kind of a point of clarification there? You know, even if you have access to the keys within the environment. So, for example, the encryption keys are stored. In a uh, or in a stored procedure, you know, doesn't that still bring those elements back into scope? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's. Uh, um, thank you for making that that clarification. And uh, you know, if if you've tokenized uh, again, kind of drawing a distinction between encryption and tokenization, uh, you've got a greater chance of maintaining your PCI compliance between your annual assessments because that sensitive data, in this case, the credit card pan, is not in your environment in an ideal scenario. Uh, Tokens also have, have the benefit of being flexible. So there is format preserving encryption, but tokens, uh, just take token X, for example, we have over 20 different token formats. So we can, uh, our tokens are length preserving when, when uh, um, appropriate. We also have both alphanumeric and numeric tokens. So some of our uh, customers like the fact that they can look at a token and see, uh, see alphabetic characters in it and recognize it that is, is a token and not an actual PAN. It's been one of the things that I found pretty interesting about some of the encryption solutions out there that are using FPE and the various modes offered through FPE or format preserving encryption is that you have a limited uh, you have a limited token set that can actually be generated. So you know, looking at uh, tokens that have to pass a LUN test or tokens that you know have to pass a mod ten check, whatever validations that you have in your applications or back end databases. You know, having a tokenization solution that's far more flexible and generating tokens that can be used in an environment is, is beneficial to your customer because, you know, at the end of the day, looking at you know, some of our, our larger, more enterprise class customers, you know, speaking to their environments through, you know, using AS400s where logic has been baked in and there's no way um, to get around that. So making sure the tokens match the look and the feel of the uh, uh, cardholder data is you know extremely important in implementing a tokenization solution that's going to be effective. Uh, that's actually a great point, and and uh, again one one final point about the fact that tokens are flexible is that you can persist portions of the original PAN value uh, in the token itself. So for example, first six and last four, so you can maintain the bin range of the token as well as the last four of that card number. So even though you're tokenizing, you still have some business utility in that data. Tokenization as a solution is also uh, very versatile. Anybody versatile, rather. Anybody who's uh, who's implemented an encryption solution has had to deal with with key management, uh, which which can be an arduous task. Again, as as uh, we just mentioned, you can persist portions of the original value, which which preserves some of the in, the uh, underlying business utility of that data if you're tokenizing. Also, tokenization can be easily integrated into your existing lines of business. So we work with customers that have call centers, e-commerce websites. They may have uh, mobile applications, uh, or they may just be tokenizing from, from utilizing our web-based uh, API. So tokenization as a solution is, is very, very versatile. And one additional point, uh, you know, why why consider tokenization beyond uh, the points that we've we've just mentioned? Requirement three four of the PCI DSS mentions that uh, the PAN needs to be rendered unreadable anywhere it is stored. So it, it also it mentions four specific ways uh, in which to do that: hashing and truncation. Uh, the benefit of those approaches is they're very easy to to implement within your infrastructure. Uh, those those are one-way operations, though, and you lose the business utility of that underlying information. So once you've hashed a credit card pan, you no longer have the capability of, of using that uh, that credit card pan. So you can't take that pan at that point and initialize an, an authorization, for example. Whereas with tokenization, you can take that token, and depending upon how you've implemented it, and we'll we'll talk about different options for implementing tokenization. You can still authorize transactions using a token. Uh, again, getting to encryption, encryption is is flexible, um, but you still are left with managing the encryption keys and 
encrypted data, as we mentioned before, is still in scope for the PCI DSS. Uh, so we're going to take just another quick uh, polling question here. Um, we'd like to know uh, roughly what percentage of your customers have fallen out of PCI compliance this year? Uh, was it more than 75% between 50 and 75, 25 to 50, less than 25% or none, which would be uh, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, so we'll give just a moment here to uh, get some answers here, uh, just less than a minute, and we'll uh, continue on with the rest of the presentation. And obviously this question is addressed to the QSAs in the audience, but um, anybody, even if you're an ISA, you understand the difficulties in maintaining your PCI compliance throughout the course of a year. As Alex mentioned earlier, you've got new technologies, the business is going to implement uh, new new functionality. And it's a constant struggle to make sure that you're not reintroducing scope in your environment. I mean, God forbid, actually, be a, a business that's forward thinking and making changes throughout the throughout the year, and then having to, you know, perpetually reassess your environment holistically. So, um, I kind of I always like the PADSS, where you know you're only addressing the modules that have been impacted uh, or that will impact the payment flow. It seems like a far less arduous. Uh, task than you know running through the whole PCI DSS. Um, you know, the PA DSS is uh, you know, modularizing. It's probably a lot more convenient there in that environment than it is in that an actual you know, network. And if you're fortunate, your organization will include uh, your assessors while they're talking about implementing that new business and not inviting you to the to the party after the fact. Right. Great. So it looks like most of the votes came in. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on through here. So when we start talking about the tokenization landscape, there are multiple ways you can implement tokenization in your environment. For example, there are on-premise solutions uh, as well as appliances, which are, are, are similar, right? You can, you can deploy an appliance in, in the cloud. The definition of on-premise these days is, is uh, fairly, uh, fairly flexible, but um, as well as processor tokenization. So you have a lot of processors that now um, will offer their merchant customers the ability to tokenize data uh, when they're when they're conducting transactions. So on the right hand of the slide, we see a number of, um, of of differences between these various approaches. So on premise and appliance tokenization, we're going to include together because again, the definition of on premise is somewhat in flux. But if you're if you're implementing tokenization in this fashion, it's going to require a card data environment. So you're going to have card data flowing into your environment hopefully in a, in a fairly well-segmented CDE. And at that point, you're going to have this, this appliance or some homegrown version of tokenization that's going to take that credit card pan, tokenize it, and then pass it into the rest of your infrastructure. These solutions typically have, have a high cost of maintenance. So because you are maintaining uh, this, this particular type of tokenization, you've got to have the associated hardware, the staff, and the support that goes along with with maintaining a solution yourself. Um, the other thing we typically see in this, this kind of scenario is that risk is still resident in your environment. So all you've done is take that sensitive data that you're trying to protect and move it from one portion of your network to another. So ultimately that responsibility is still still falls on the merchant. Well, it's a, the, 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 uh, to jump in real quick, the on-prim play is basically in the analogy of well, are you going to stash your money underneath your underneath your mattress? Well, if you're going to stash it underneath your mattress, and then you're going to say, you know what, I'm going to go get an on-prem tokenization solution. You're, all you're doing is moving it from underneath one mattress to underneath a different mattress, right? So why not move it to a bank? Why not get it out of your environment or the customer's environment in this case? Because uh, you don't want your customer breach. You don't want their data stolen, right? So if you're just moving data from one, you know, encrypted environment to another encrypted environment, what, what problem are you actually solving? That's the challenge that, you know, we as an organization, has, has, we've always tried to address that. Um, certainly on-prem has, uh, has its purpose whenever you're talking about, for example, healthcare and privacy data where, you know, those types of, uh, you know, those types of environments are, you know, don't have any scoping responsibility. So looking at PCI on-prem has never made a whole lot of sense to me. And we've encountered situations where the tokens are actually considered the intellectual property of the vendor. So we've dealt with uh, with customers 
who want to migrate from, from an appliance uh, solution uh, because that, that uh, solution is no longer supported. However, they had some issues getting that data detokenized because the vendor of that solution considered the tokens to be their own intellectual property. Moving to processor tokenization. So in this case, the tokens tend to be specific to that processor. So if you have multiple processors or you want to switch processors, you're going to have to go through a process of detokenizing that data and retokenizing it with the new processor if you continue to use processor-based tokenization. Uh, similar to what we just mentioned with tokens being the intellectual property of a vendor given an appliance solution, tokens uh, with processor tokenization tend to often be the property of the processor. So you see similar reluctance in the case of some processors to detokenize that data or return that data to, to the customer in the event that they want to switch processors, uh, which kind of gets us to point number three. A lot of processors then the reason they're offering tokenization is because uh, uh, they want to maintain the security of their particular solution and they don't give customers the opportunity to detokenize. We do have customers that do have a necessity sometimes to detokenize and view that original pan. Sometimes this is related to fraud prevention. We've seen this in other cases as well. Uh, oftentimes, if you're using process of tokenization, you're going to have limited integration options. So whatever... Um, whatever uh, lines of business that that particular processor is used to seeing, that's how they're going to support that tokenization. So it may be, they may be limited to e-commerce, for example. So if you have, um, you know, a mobile application, you need to tokenize from there. Uh, you may not be able to do so using that particular, that particular processor. That's uh, yeah, to, to address the integration points. I mean, most organizations today are, um, you know, they're, they're on what's called omni-channel, and that's a term that's been used quite a bit. And so they're, they've got a mobile device, they've got a e-com channel, they're, they've got a call center that, you know, is, is, is taking calls for, you know, either orders or uh, returns, whatever the case may be. So now you have, you know, three different environments that are in scope. So unless your tokenization solution is addressing all of those, you know, data flows and how that data is entering your environment, then you're implementing a partial solution. So processor tokenization, at least, from our experience in the past, has been you know very limited in what it can achieve. You know, unless you want to pass the payment card data through your environment to the processor, get the token back. Well, now you know that that entire flow that touches the cardholder data before it's tokenized at the processor is in scope. Which you know that's uh, again you know looking looking at uh, kind of the power of tokenization. Uh, we'll get into this a little bit later. Processor tokenization just seems to be kind of a hey, me too. Hey, we're doing it over here, but or we're just adding this feature because. It, increases the stickiness of our solution so you don't leave and find a different processor. And processors, for obvious reasons, are, are focused on on, uh, on, on tokenizing uh, card, card data. They're, they're primarily focused on protecting the actual payment transaction itself. So generally speaking, they only tokenize PCI data. Tokenization can actually be used to, to protect any sensitive data set. And uh, if you're using processor tokenization, typically that's not going to be a um, functionality that's available to you. Last in this, uh, when we're talking about the tokenization landscape, you have cloud-based tokenization providers. So the benefit of using a cloud-based tokenization provider, unlike on-prem or appliance, is that sensitive data gets completely removed from your environment. So that can reduce your scope as well as your risk. Additionally, you have multiple options for integration. And those integration points can be outside of your environment, which prevents, prevents, prevents rather that cardholder data from ever entering your environment. So unlike the on-prem or the appliance situation, where that data has to enter your environment in order to get to that appliance or that uh, on-premise solution, a cloud-based tokenization provider present, prevent. Man, I'm, I'm really having difficult with the uh, whole prevents and presents. Uh, can can present opportunities to tokenize that data before it ever enters your environment. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is, you know, we're, you know, certainly we're slanted because we're a cloud-based tokenization solution. So let's address, you know, kind of the, the elephant in the room. But at the end of the day, if we can get, you know, get customers or get, you know, companies, merchant service providers alike using a tokenization solution and bought into the idea that tokenization truly is a better and more effective way to secure data, I mean, at the end of the day, you have a layered security approach from the network looking all the way in, right? So if there's if there's no data there to be breached, whether it's 
on-prem processor cloud, uh, we're achieving a, a very, very high standard. So that's, I think that's, you know, we're, again, we will be slanted because of who we are and what we, you know, what we believe based on what we've seen. But what I can say with, you know, uh, absolute affinity is that uh, as long as you have a customer using tokenization, their security posture is going to be by far stronger than, than if it were left alone. And I guess that uh, it's, a, it's a good transition, you know, into kind of the different types of tokens that are available. So, you know, just to kind of recap, we've talked about what is tokenization, why do we need to do it, why does it matter to your customer. Now we're uh, we talked about the tokenization landscape, the different solutions that are available. Uh, so, what different types of tokens are available? So, you know, at the top you'll see network uh, network slash payment tokens versus security tokens. Um, now, there's any number of different ways that people look at how tokens are generated who's generating them and kind of the token life cycle, right? So, hang on, sorry, we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty. Uh, it appears that the slide being shown is not the correct one. So let's see if we can do a quick stop. Here we go. All right, back on track. All right. So uh, jumping back in, so network and payment tokens, looking at you know how the industry kind of coins uh, the different types of tokens that are available. Uh, uh, network tokens are generated by the card brands. So the card brands will generate a token that is given to the issuer. Like, so issuers can subscribe to the service, um, issuers being card issuers. Uh, and then these tokens are kind of distributed. So you're looking at, you know, the Apple Pays, the Android Pays, um, you know, the different tokens that are passed around. So the things to kind of note about network tokens is that, you know, network tokens uh, are primarily used by payment service providers, right? So they're, they are issued, they're handed around. So this is a way that, you know, they're, you know, the, the, the card brands and the card networks are attempting to uh, assist in token, you know, the ubiquity of tokenization, which is a good thing for the industry overall. Again, using tokens anywhere is a good thing as opposed to, um, you know, as opposed to just using the cardholder data. Um, you know, the business as usual aspect of using network tokens, which we'll get to here in a minute, is a little bit more challenging. So um, looking at, you know, the uh, different network tokens that are issued by the different issuers as they subscribe to the service uh, with the card brands, you know, you're going to have any number of different tokens that are, that are issued to you uh, by the uh, payment service provider. So looking at um, having a vault for uh, first data than a vault for Chase Payment Tech. You know, for example, most people today are using multiple payment service providers because of uh, business continuity purposes. So if you're tokenizing with both of those, now you're managing two token vaults, and that just gets to be you know a little bit more challenging to uh, to manage than if you're using kind of a single unified or universal token vault. Um, a lot of the network tokens, excuse me, all of the network tokens are considered low value or single use. So every time the card is run, a new token is generated. And that, that is very problematic for organizations that are doing any type of analytics using uh, the credit card, which they shouldn't be doing, but in theory using a token, which is just, just as unique but non-sensitive. Um, so you want to have persistence with the tokens instead of a single use or low value token. So the, reasons why, the reason why it's called low value is because it's single use and you are not able to perform recurring payments or any other types of business functions that assist with you know, a frictionless payment or uh, with you know, these types of business like analytics types of initiatives within the organization your customers may be, may be using. So um, you know, the, the uh, uh, network tokens are uh, explicitly meant for payment transactions, right? So you're not gonna see network tokens uh, tokenizing or uh, obfuscating or uh, desensitizing uh, privacy data, HIPAA data, whatever the case may be. It's, it, it's built by the card brands for the card brand networks. Uh, so that's, that's network tokens. Now looking at data security tokens, uh, these are going to be, you know, we address the uh, uh, kind of the on-prem uh, appliance cloud-based types of providers. Um, that's where data security tokens are going to be used. So these are issued by the third-party provider. So looking at uh, the the uh, the vendor of the product or the solution that you're using, they're going to generate what's called a closed loop token. That closed loop token only works with that system or with that vendor, depending on how they're generating the token. So, uh, data security tokens are meant, uh, you know, in, in kind of the value of having a data security token is that it is specific to your environment. You can't, you know, nobody would be able to steal your your token vault and use it uh, uh, across different merchants and service providers because they would not ever be able to de-tokenize and get back to the original data. 
Uh, tokens can be used with multiple processors or third parties. So again, getting back to that, you're, you have a universal token vault that is uh, you know, where the tokenization, detokenization is occurring before the data is handed off to the third party pro provider. So looking at TokenX, you know, just a brief example, we're integrated with over 70 payment service providers. So our customers want to use us to uh, and, uh, you know, facilitate transactions across multiple processors, whether it's domestic or international, which is a very powerful thing whenever you're you know, a global organization. Um, you know, data security tokens are persistent. Uh, you know, this is a configurable attribute with most data security or uh, most uh, uh, on-prem or cloud-based solutions or closed-loop solutions. So you can persist the token. Uh, it's called high value because um, it maps one-to-one -to, -one to the credit card, which is a very powerful, uh, uh, I'd say, capability of a tokenization solution that gives you the ability to understand what your users are doing, run marketing campaigns, um, understand, you know, data is driving business today. Having that unique solution that's non-sensitive is going to empower your organization to understand uh, and make decisions for the future. So, again, kind of the persistent component of that is, is why it's considered high value. Last but not least, looking at, uh, you know, the solutions available today, data security tokens generally have the flexibility to address the different data sets. So, looking at de-identifying privacy health information or uh, pseudonymizing or anonymizing privacy information. Um, you know, this can be used with account, uh, you know, bank account information. It can be used with any number of different data sets uh, that your, 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 uh, your company may be de dealing with. And John, you know, one of the things I wanted to rope you in here on is looking at CCPA, uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act. One of the things that's really interesting there is it addresses privacy of the state of California constituency. Uh, where, you know, it's sub basically $750 a head per breach, you know, would you want to use or even attempt to use a network token to try to start securing that data considering, you know, the type of uh, backbone they have for supporting this? No, I, and, and actually the CCPA is, a, is an excellent point. So the CCPA is actually um, reflective of the GDPR, which is a privacy law uh, that's, that took effect earlier this year in, in Europe, and so there are specific obligations under both of those particular laws to protect uh, personally identifiable information, which would be any information including a payment card transaction. So any organization, if you're an ISA, the organization that you're employed by or a QSA evaluating um, you know, third parties, those organizations are, are now likely to be uh, subject to additional, additional obligations compliance obligations beyond the PCI DSS. So any organization uh, that's doing business now in the United States or Europe is likely uh, subject to some privacy regulation. And if you're using network or payment tokens, obviously you're gonna be limited in, in just protecting that payment data versus other more versatile data security solutions such as cloud-based tokenization would enable you to use that, that solution to protect any data set, not just payment card data. Sure, sure. So let me ask you this, Avery. Are there any questions that we can address real quick before we scoot on down the road? Uh, we don't have any questions quite yet. Uh, Tabitha wanted to, to uh, jump in and say along with GDPR, you know, uh, not just the California Consumer Privacy Act, but GDPR obviously has uh, some strong, uh, is a strong use case for tokenization of protecting privacy data. So. Yeah, and actually the, the terminology used in both the CCPA and GDPR is pseudonymization of data. So that is, uh, pseudonymization really is synonymous with, with tokenization. So it's taking a sensitive data element and replacing it with a pseudonym, whereas we defined tokenization earlier as taking a sensitive data element and replacing it with a token. So you have that, that similar sort of, of, of approach to securing data where you're taking something that's sensitive or in this case identifying about a particular individual and replacing it with something that is, that is not identifying or non-sensitive. That's the, uh, yeah, and thank you very much, Tabitha, for that, because that's, uh, you know, the, uh, the more and more that we are talking with existing customer base, they're, uh, you know, contacting us saying, hey, well, you know what, um, payment card data is all well and good, but now we need to start addressing privacy data. Let's talk about you know, the data flows that exist or the data stores that, uh, you know, we need to pseudonymize uh, in order to ensure that that data is now uh, not at risk. Uh, we have another question that just came in um, asking, what's an example of an instance where tokenization would be a good recommendation for a customer? And I think, you know, we've touched on some various PCI 
use cases we've touched on. Uh, we just just now getting onto uh, privacy and PII use cases, but um, just to throw it out to the panel for you, you two. So it's actually a, a great question. Our next slide uh, talks about why tokenization why tokenization matters to your customers. So you know, we've gone through kind of you know why what are the PCI requirements? What is tokenization? Uh, what are the, what's the landscape? What are the different types of tokens that we can use? Um, now, you know, let's talk a little bit about, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll premise this slide with a response to that question. You know, tokenization is excellent for organizations that, you know, one of two things, they want to reduce PCI scope or they want to eliminate the risk of handling sensitive data. And in this case, since we're, you know, kind of talking to a QSA population, it's the elimination of payment card data within the environment. So, you know, looking at this next slide, why tokenization matters to your customer. Uh, your customer needs solutions as their compliance landscape evolves, right? So looking at uh, tokenization as the customer landscape evolves, um, they have continual PCI scope reduction efforts. So while you are looking at, um, you know, or assessing the customer environment, you know, that's a point in time assessment. Next year, they're going to have different technologies. Next year, they're going to have uh, different business processes and people. So um, you know, assisting them with a, a uh, you know, a tokenized data element where as they're changing processes, people, and technology, they're not reintroducing scope into their environment is a very powerful thing to, uh, you know, to recommend to them. Um, your customers, you know, looking at, uh, um, you know, from a compliance landscape standpoint, I'd, I'd say, you know, you want to help them achieve compliance where previously not possible. So, so talking about the uh, the AS400 scenario, looking at organizations that use that, it's you know these types of applications are hard coded. Um, so how do you solve that problem with you know a uh, a network token that doesn't look, smell, or feel, or won't meet any of the validation requirements like a mod 10 check of uh, you know of, of the uh, application in the AS400, expecting a you know mod mod 10 compatible data element, right? So last but not least, and at least in that section, is looking at, you know, tokenization addresses as previously, as previously stated, multiple data sets uh, within the, com to meet compliance obligations. So as a very, very <laughs> stumbling through that statement, you know, you need to have a uh, tokenization solution that meets their compliance obligations, not only with PCI, I mean, that's the one that has the most teeth right now, but in the future, looking at privacy and the cost per head, uh, for a data reach in, for example, California, now what has more bite? You know, privacy data is coming right along. So having a tokenization solution and recommending one that can address multiple data sets across their compliance landscape is going to be very important. Now, I think it's worth mentioning here again the flexibility that tokenization provides you. So PCI data, right, that's a, that's an easy use case. It's, it's uh, a very discrete set of data. But when you're looking at uh, tokenization options or token format options, you can preserve, again, like the first six and the last four. So as your customer, um, you know, considers solutions to implement to protect this data, one of the, one of the benefits of tokenization is that they continue to maintain some, some business utility of that data, even though they've taken steps to protect it. Uh, so we just had another question come in. Um, how does TokenX typically interact with QSAs and their clients when there is a play for tokenization? So generally speaking, what will happen is um, it, it works both ways. So, you know, as we as we find customers who are, you know, working, um, you know, working with a, a QSAC, uh, they'll come to us and they'll say, you know, we, you know, we're already doing tokenization. Uh, we'd like to switch assessors to make sure we have a new set of eyes, whatever the case may be. And generally what we'll do is we'll, you know, we, we stay very kind of agnostic whenever it comes to different assessors. Uh, but what we'll do is if we know uh, if we know that a particular QSAC has experience assessing tokenized environments, then we'll you know give them a, a laundry list of those of those QSACs so they can uh, pick and choose. Now, on the other hand, we have QSACs that come to TokenX and say, "Listen, I've got a customer. They you know just for whatever reason cannot. It's not possible for them to achieve compliance, or they have very rigid scope reduction." Uh, you know, guidance from their uh, C-levels, they want to get rid of payment card data because it's debilitating their ability to do business. Um, so can you help us out, come up with a strategy? So a lot of what we'll do is we can work in the background and uh, assist with, you know, different strategies for implementing tokenization and whether that's on-prem, whether that's, uh, you know, processor-based, you know, kind of looking at it from a 360 vantage point and making recommendations and coming up with a few different strategies that can be presented by the QSA to their customers for scope reduction. So looking at TokenX, yes, we are a data security platform, 
but we're also very good at the strategy side of data security and making recommendations and understanding complex environments because that's what we've done for the last decade, right? And just because we have former QSAs and ISAs on staff, in the event one of our customers uh, is, is going through their annual PCI assessments and their assessor has questions uh, about the implementation of our tokenization solution, we're always happy to, to talk to those assessors and uh, you know, explain kind of how our platform works and how we protect our customers' data. Right, right. And so um, it's kind of jumping back into the, the why tokenization matters to your customer. One of the, you know, you look at the you look at the balance of our customer base and you see that they largely want to either reduce PCI scope or they want to address the risk of storing payment card data, right? So you know, providing a solution that takes you know takes a customer beyond compliance uh, to eliminating risk. That's a very powerful asset for you. So if you're making recommendations and providing strategies around not only achieving compliance and maintaining it, but also eliminating risk over time, what you're doing is you're helping them evolve their environment for future business productivity. So we've seen those types of conversations go very, very well, um, you know, whenever we've had them. And kind of last but not least, PCI is, uh, you know, I used to be a CISO of a payment gateway. And... Uh, PCI took a thousand man. I mean, we were probably 50 to 75 people. Took a thousand man hours. It took you know 25 thousand dollars just to just to get an assessor in the door. Let alone you know the cost of the pen testing, the application security, the scanning, you know all the um, cap uh, capex outlay for different assets that we had for you know FIM log management and whatever the case may be. You roll that up, and now you're talking about a very 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 expensive endeavor. Not that I would suggest. Otherwise, because having a strong security kind of layered uh, security approach um, is, is, is a best practice and would never deviate from that. But let's, let's be honest here, PCI is certainly a beast. So helping organizations reduce their scope and exposure and giving them the ability to reallocate resources, you know, the smaller companies reallocate you know, those funds to more, more uh, kind of uh, revenue generating types of functions and reallocating resources for the larger organizations to strengthen their security posture you know, leveraging a, a solution like tokenization is something that you know will empower you as a QSA with the customer base that you have. And I think it's important to note that that even if you're spending um, all the that time, effort, energy, money on those security solutions to protect this sensitive data, in this case PCI data, the risk is still uh, resident in your environment. It's some 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 area, even if it's a CDE, you still maintain, you still have some level of risk. If you're tokenizing that data, you have removed that data, that risk from your environment. Uh, we just saw with the Marriott breach that was announced on Friday, they were encrypting their their payment card data, but they couldn't um, they couldn't guarantee that the that the encryption keys had not also been breached. So again, if you're using a, a, a here's a plug for cloud-based tokenization, you've removed that sensitive data completely from your environment. So not only are you not having to manage those encryption keys, you're not worried about a scenario where someone breaches your environment and also has access to the associated encryption keys. So, and, and, and before we jump into that next slide, I think, you know, the kind of the messaging here is simplicity. You know, you're looking at very complex technologies, you're looking at very complex environments. So looking at simplicity and rolling out solutions that are simplistic for your customer that are not going to require you know, significant application changes, they're not going to require code changes, they're not going to require you know, uh, you know, significant infrastructure changes. Uh, simplicity is the key here, and that's the reason, kind of, and the power behind tokenization, in our opinion. So, kind of going to the next slide, evaluating tokenization providers. So, we've walked you through basically from from the onset of PCI through, uh, you know, tokenization all the way into, okay, well, you know what, you guys have made a good sell here. We think the tokenization in whatever form is going to be beneficial for our customers. So how do I evaluate a tokenization provider? So what we're doing here is we're laying out a few of the things that uh, we've seen in different RFPs, uh, different questions that were asked from small, medium, large, large enterprise businesses around evaluating tokenization solutions. And um, the, the, one of the biggest uh, questions or the I, I most frequently asked questions that we see is how, you know, can you address how we're doing business today? And what they mean by that uh, is are you, can you address all the different ways that I'm interacting with cardholder data. I share data with third parties. I have different modes of collecting data through e-commerce, through batch files, through uh, call center, you know, insert, uh, you know, point of interaction with cardholder data here. You have to have a tokenization solution that will address all of those. Otherwise, you're going to have uh, not only, you know, a partially tokenized environment, but now you still have 
you know, a pretty big scope, uh, scope, uh, well, PCI scope uh, liability within your environment. And you also want to make sure that the tokenization provider has the integration support while you're going through that implementation to support all those different channels of your business. So after you've identified that they, they can support all your current lines of business, you also want to, to make sure that while you're going through that integration, they can help you bring, bring that data, tokenize it, and support you in an ongoing way. So I just want to take a quick second here and uh, launch another poll while we're on this topic. Um, what percentage of your customers are currently utilizing tokenization? And uh, I don't mean to derail the conversation. We can keep talking over this. Just wanted to get some uh, some information from our attendees on, just to give us a, a rough perspective on on the adoption of tokenization from uh, the QSAs in the room. Sure, sure. And, and so to kind of can you continue on because I know that we are pushing the the, the time limit limit here. So the the next question that we have is, you know, what third party processors or service providers are supported? So it's great that you have a you know a solution like for on prem and processors that. Um, you know, they will take data and they will tokenize it and they'll give you a token back. Um, but, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you provide a tokenization solution from end to end from the point of interaction, the initial point where that data is in, you know, hitting your edge, your environment to the point where it's exiting. So, um, you know, what third parties are integrated? Can you detokenize, for example, outside of your environment? So the backend payment server is not in scope. Um, those types of questions about how you how you can assist your customer in hand, handing data off to who they're doing business with is a big, big, big consideration because at the end of the day, nobody's air gapped. Everybody's talking with everybody. Everybody's doing business with everybody. So making sure that you have the capabilities to hand that data off to their third party providers or their partners in the format that is expected is extremely important. Um, the other question that we're seeing is kind of referenced earlier, what data sets can be tokenized? If you're only process or if you're only tokenizing payment card data today, well, you're chances of being around from a tokenization standpoint in three to five years is probably between zero and none. If you're looking at you know, providing a solution that uh, can provide across multiple data sets and data streams, now we're talking. Now you have that many-to-many -many, uh, type of relationship with business systems and applications that organize, you know, basically how organizations are doing business today. So uh, being able to tokenize and secure and, and de-risk uh, your customer's environment using a flexible tokenization solution is imperative. And just to connect that bullet point with the one previously, you need to be able to share that data with third parties. So, for example, we have a number of insurance companies that are customers, and they're tokenizing PII, not just PCI data, but they still need to share that data that they're tokenizing with us with some of their partners. So, when you're tokenizing, you want to make sure that 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 your tokenization provider can facilitate you sharing that data with not only payment processors, but any third party that you need to share that data with. Right. No, I totally agree there. And just to kind of reverse the last two bullet items, because I think um, you know, it's just a, my preference is where is a cardholder data stored? So there's going to be different requirements your customers have for it has to be stored on premise. It has to be you know, stored in the cloud. We don't want the data here. You know, where is it stored is another question. But uh, the one that I really care about here is who owns the data? You know, we mentioned earlier that um, uh, we've seen two different scenarios with, uh, you know, both on-prem and one processor, uh, where you know the customer's been charged to get their data back. That's not the right way to do business. So if somebody is giving us their data to secure while they want to use it and they're paying us for that, their data is their data, right? So a big question that you want to ask these different tokenization solutions is. If we use your solution, who owns the data? Do they have? To, does our customer have the ability to get it back without having to pay for that? Um, are your tokens considered any intellectual property, or do you will you allow your customer to detokenize? Because uh, business relationships, as they are today, uh, they don't last forever. So being able to get your customer's data back so they can transition it to a new provider uh, is extremely important. So. Um, whenever it comes to evaluating a tokenization provider, here are kind of the top reasons that we're top questions that we see QSAs, uh, you know, companies furnishing RFPs or, you know, uh, just companies coming to us asking for information. They really want uh, you know, to know these, these top six questions. So kind of moving right along into uh, the implementation pitfall. So as a QSA, where you're going to see the implementation of tokenization fail uh, not maximizing PCI scope reduction. So, um, you know, taking the example for, you know, a, a few of the payment gateways that we've seen in the past, they will only address 
the e-commerce channel. So that's all well and good if you're only going to assess the you know the data stream from you know the e-commerce application to the processor, right? So they'll provide an iframe or they'll provide a JavaScript implementation for accepting cardholder data, but they haven't taken into account the call center that there's nightly batch files that are you know settlement files that are sent back to the customer with credit card data in it. Uh, they have mobile applications that don't uh, tokenize data, so you know basically. Uh, that data is decrypted in the customer environment. Uh, so, you know, making sure that you find a tokenization solution, again, that uh, will maximize PCI scope reduction uh, is extremely important. And I think the easiest scenario to illustrate this is the case of an e-commerce environment. Why, ha why have you uh, a web server in your CDE where you're accepting this payment card data and then tokenizing that CDE if you can use an e-commerce solution that's hosted by a third party tokenization provider and they can tokenize that data and send you the token so you never have to accept that card data in the first place. Right. There are technologies today that exist where you can completely buffer a, you know, an omni-channel environment from ever seeing payment card data. Uh, so those, those types of conversations, you know, if, if you have interest or customers who want to maximize scope reduction, um, you know, we have a few different ways to do that with you know, varying technologies. So uh, let us know if you're interested in, in learning more about that. Um, the you know it, it, you know this kind of this next one falls more on the QSA and that's incomplete discovery or mapping right so as you're going through and you're creating your evidence around you know data flow diagrams where where data is stored processed or transmitted you know the holy trinity of PCI um, making sure that your customer is giving you all the information where's the data stored how does the data get there how does the data leave who interacts with that data is incredibly important because we've seen environments where tokenization has been implemented. Uh, and then just to find out that there is a web server or, you know, a, a company uh, file server that has an Excel spreadsheet with, you know, thousands or even hundreds of thousands of, of payment card data in it, you have not really truly uh, discovered or mapped the uh, environment appropriately. And that you know, doesn't necessarily fall on the QSA. Yes, you're asking the question, but making sure that you're doing that exploratory kind of conversation of, are you certain there's nothing else out there? There's no other places where, you know, this cardholder data can live where it needs to be tokenized. And last but not least, I just want to make one, one sure. point about that um, discovery or mapping phase. Um, that's particularly important when you start talking about other data sets because PCI data is, is a, again, a discrete data element and organizations generally um, have a good sense of, of where that data, how they're accepting that data and where that data lives in their environment. Now, it's not going to fall on a QSA necessarily, but if an organization is considering protecting uh, the personal information in their environment, that mapping phase is particularly important because that data comes into environment in, in many ways. Well, fair enough, fair enough. And, and last but not least, again, getting back to the data set support thing, as you just kind of talked about, I'm not going to hammer on this one too much because it's pretty evident by this point, but, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, whenever you're picking a, 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 token, a tokenization solution today, you're not limiting, you know, you're not saying, hey, customer, I'm going to roll out tokenization for PCI, but, you know, <laughs> hope your dreams are cheap whenever it comes to privacy and PHI data, right? So you want to have a solution, again, that, address, that addresses multiple data sets so you're helping your customer down the path. So uh, we only have about four minutes left, and one thing that I do want to share is the PCI tokenization tool set. So what I've listed here are all of the documents that are pertinent around tokenization that the PCI Security Standards Council has furnished. Um, the one that I will pay particular attention to here is the very last one. So the third-party security assurance. Uh, responsibility, well, it's, it's uh, third-party security assurance um, uh, guidelines from the Security Standards Council. What the reason why I point this one out is because this has the responsibility matrix in it. The importance of the responsibility matrix, if you want to switch to the next slide, is that this basically, from a you know, for example, a QSA standpoint, um, it actually shows uh, similar to a report on compliance. Uh, you know, whose responsibility the control is based on the based on the technology that's rolled out. And we're getting to that slide here real quick. You can see here that um, in the, in the right-hand corner, uh, bottom right-hand corner, that the potential for scope reduction uh, in the environment versus the responsibility, um, it, this addresses, and this is actually from the Security Standards Council, you can see that from an on-premise all the way up to a cloud-based environment, you're, you're maximizing scope reduction and putting a lot of the controls back onto the tokenization service provider so the responsibility matrix is something that the tokenization service provider should be able to furnish to you as a QSA 
and then report, uh, provide their attestation of compliance to ensure that you have the confidence in their compliance, uh, you know, from a, 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 of their PCI compliance. Uh, and then you know which controls are applicable to the TPSP versus the entity that you're assessing. So as a QSA, the responsibility matrix and the uh, uh, third party security assurance document are of particular, uh, particular importance since 2016. So, um, I'll leave uh, leave the the takeaways to uh, John real quick. Yeah, and I just want to highlight actually on this responsibility matrix. I mean, the question was brought up earlier: how does TokenX interact with with QSAs? And this is a perfect example. I mean, this um, you know, if we have a customer who's who's going through their annual assessment, a lot of times we'll get questions from QSAs about who's responsible for which aspects of our customer's PCI compliance. And we're going to finish here talking about the, the takeaways, right? So tokenization, uh, and this is this is key, does not cannibalize the the QSA's uh, business. I mean, you, you organizations still have to be PCI compliant, and regardless of whether or not they've implemented tokenization, there's still a number of controls that they're going to be responsible for meeting, and the QSAs are essential for helping ensure that that is in fact taking place. Uh, tokenization implementations hinge on accurate QSA artifacts. We talked about the data discovery, data mapping. Uh, the QSA still plays, again, a very essential role in PCI compliance, even if an organization has implemented tokenization. Uh, we also talked about tokenization versus encryption versus segmentation. Segmentation, you know, broadly speaking, is, is difficult, expensive. Encryption is a very flexible solution. However, there's a lot of management overhead, and you can still be in scope uh, if you have access to the encryption keys, and again, as we just, uh, I hate to, to harp on Marriott, but as we saw, uh, you know, your, the encrypted data is only is only secure insofar as those encryption keys are secure. Um, tokenization, by contrast, is a powerful, flexible, and cost-effective solution. So it's it's flexible in that it can be implemented into any of your existing lines of business. It's powerful because it can protect not it can protect any data set, not just PCI. And cost effective, particularly if you're using a cloud-based provider, you don't have the associated hardware and and personnel costs associated with something you're trying to do on-prem. And tokenization solutions should address more than just compliance. I mean the, the compliance is a necessity, but it's not sufficient. At the end of the day, the PCI DSS is there to help organizations uh, ensure that they're meeting, you know, a baseline security standard. So tokenization, we're not here just to help organizations click or check that compliance checkbox. We're here because we want our customers to be secure. And a tokenization solution should solve multiple compliance obligations, not just PCI. And uh, just to reiterate uh, one of the points here about cost effectiveness, I did want to bring up again that we do have a resource available in the handout section of this of this webinar, a, uh, a tokenization for QSAs guide that includes a cost analysis breakdown of on-premise versus cloud tokenization solutions and, and the basic hidden fees and the, the, the various uh, comparisons that you could expect when, when comparing the two. Uh, so that's it that we uh, that we have for you guys today. Thank you for attending. Uh, again, we are TokenX. We're an enterprise class data security platform uh, among the first third-party cloud tokenization providers founded by two former QSAs. We're flexible, scalable, and com comprehensive. Uh, we offer omni-channel acceptance channels and uh, have a global consumer base. And uh, should you guys have any further questions, please feel free to reach out at sales at tokenx.com. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, we commit to get back to you before the end of the day tomorrow. And um, thank you again for attending. And uh, we, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Yep. Thanks again, guys. Thank you.